problem. So, okay. So let me just uh, flip in my notes to the next problem. All right, so now let's do something from optimization. Okay, so let's find the largest area of a rectangle whose base is on the x-axis. And upper vertices are on graph of y equals e to the negative x squared over 12. Let's see, we should have a. Oh, we had a. All right, so who wants to explain how we start with this then? We need to find our objective function and our constraint equation. OK, so let's do exactly that. Want to mark this up. Let's get a copy of that. And then let's um, say what is our objective and what is our constraint. Okay, so who wants to identify some of this stuff for us? And if you give me an objective function or a constraint equation in terms of some variables, you should explain to me what those variables actually are. Right, like if you start telling me L and W or W and H or something, like you can't just say those letters. You have to actually tell me what those letters mean in this problem. So what are we thinking for the objective function? So the area of the rectangle, right? So the objective is the area of the rectangle. It says, why is that the objective? It says find the largest area, right? For the objective, you're always looking for what you are maximizing or minimizing. So you're looking for these superlative words, right? You're looking for largest, cheapest, most economical, uh, you know, least amount of fencing, right? You're looking for those superlative words. So largest area. So clearly, um, whatever. Now, this is not the final answer yet because the objective has to be a function, right? I can't write that the objective is the area of a rectangle. Right? That's not an objective. That's just some words that describe what the objective is. But at least we have identified that whatever we're going to write down as the objective, it better be a function that represents the area of the rectangle. OK. So we're still not done yet, right? So although we've identified that the area is the objective, we still need a function that represents the area. So we need to introduce some, var uh, some suitable variables. We need to write the area of, of the rectangle in terms of those variables. Well, if, like I said, if you just tell me x times y, I have no idea what x is and I have no idea what y is. So you need to also tell me what x and y are in your objective function. What do they mean? Right, think back to when you were doing the objective function um, in group work, right? We had that barn problem where the fence was like split up into four pens or something. And remember there was some confusion in the groups because some students were using X to mean the whole thing. Some students were meaning, using X to mean just one 
length of one pad. Some students were meaning X to mean the vertical length, right? So there was a lot of confusion, even though you were all kind of saying the same thing, right? So it's very important that we define our variables. I'll wait for Matan to finish uh, typing. Let's see, X will represent the length of the base on the X axis and Y the height. So you would like X to be the entire base. You'd like Y to be the height. Okay, and then the area of the rectangle would be now I can say that the area of this rectangle is a function of both x and y, and that would be x times y. Okay, so now what's my constraint equation? Y equals negative so let's uh let's see if everyone's kind of awake. So what is the constraint equation? Marvin, I'm disappointed that you didn't go for the obvious troll answer. OK, well, two people said they disagree. So those two people who said I disagree, do you want to be brave and explain to us why you disagree? Emily, you said you disagreed. Can you um can you see why you disagree? They will say that I disagree is the correct answer. I mean, I honestly don't know the right answer. I just think it's wrong. Okay, that's fair. So everyone, most everyone actually said that y equals e to the negative x squared over 12 was correct. So it is incorrect. That is not the constraint equation. So problem is this x is not this x. Right? This is why it's so important to define your variables and make sure you understand what these variables actually mean. So when I say that this this point here has to lie on the graph y equals uh, e to the negative x squared over 12, that's really a shorthand for saying y is the y coordinate of that graph, x is the x coordinate of that graph. But this x and this y mean the length and the width of the rectangle. So this point here is actually x over 2. And so then that's e to the negative x over 2 squared over 12. So keep in mind that if you're going to call this whole thing x, then that means this x coordinate here is x over 2, and this x coordinate here is negative x over 2. And so that means your constraint will be slightly different from what has already been given to you. So I think it's probably easier to exploit the symmetry, not worry about that. Let's redefine our variables. So I'm actually going to call the half length x and the entire height is still y that's perfectly fine because then that means that this point here is x comma y right 
So if you want to use the equation of your graph, you have to make sure that you've actually set up your variables that are consistent with that, right? That your whatever you're calling x actually is the x coordinate of whatever is the relevant point. Why are we using x and y for the rectangle and both variables are used already in the constraint? I'm not sure exactly what that equation what that question is supposed to mean. Why not L and W? I mean, you're allowed to call your variables whatever you want. In fact, the fact that I'm even talking about redefining these variables actually kind of tells you to be very careful. I mean, everyone was very quick to call this X, but there was already an X in the problem. And what you were about to call X was not consistent with the X that was already defined for you. So in fact, I'm kind of answering your question that way. But you have to be careful that you actually are consistent with everything else in the problem. I agree that if you're, if you're going to call the whole thing X, you actually should have called it L because there's already an X in the problem. You can get it confused. So in any event, so now we actually have to change. The area function is actually no longer X, Y. The area function is technically 2X, Y. So that extra factor of 2 is not really a big deal. But now we can actually write that the constraint is E, Y equals E to the negative X squared over 12. Okay, so make sure of that. In fact, I mean, when we do these types of problems where we have like a rectangle or something inscribed in the graph of some equation, typically you want X and Y to be the coordinates of some vertex of that rectangle. So make sure that you don't necessarily call the whole thing X. All right, so now let's actually move on with the problem. So now what is our goal? So now what do I do here? What is my next step? Now that I've identified the constraint and the objective, what do I do? What is the role of this constraint, right? What am I doing with this? So substitute the constraint, okay. So in other words, wherever I see a Y, I'm putting E to the negative X squared over 12, so that means my area function is this thing, and now I can write down what my goal is. Goal. So do I want the dimensions or do I want the actual area? It says find the largest area. So I actually do want the maximum value. So find maximum. What is our interval here? Zero to infinity. Okay. Right, notice that Matana's actually included zero. So including zero means you're including the degenerate case when x equals zero, which means that case where the length is zero, so you just get this line segment, and that's perfectly fine, right? It just means that the rectangle is zero area. That means it's clearly not going to give you the maximum area, but we should still include it in our analysis. Pray for this. All right, so now um, we should also know how to proceed generally, right? Once you get it to this point where you have your goal, now we should all know what to do here, right? We find the critical numbers, and then we do a sign chart or a second derivative test to um, verify everything. So find the critical numbers. Okay, so where does F prime not exist? Well, that's gonna give us none. Right? There's no absolute values. There's no fractions less than one. Or sorry, exponents less than one. There's nothing like that. This is a perfectly differentiable function. Now let's take our derivative and set it equal to zero. Let's make sure you actually do you know product rule correctly here. We get first derivative second plus second derivative first and setting that equal to zero. So then the next line. So let's actually um, simplify this. So simplify, let's factor out the e to the negative x squared over 12, right? That's on both terms. And then here we're left with on the first term, negative 2x over 12 times 2x. That's negative 4x squared over 12. That's negative x squared over 3. And then here we're just left with, looks like a 2. 
All right, and then we're going to um, set that equal to zero. Okay, good. So now setting this equal to zero, remember that means each term is equal to zero, but this this can never be equal to zero. Right, e to that's the nice thing about e. Um, e to anything can never be equal to zero. So this equation is really just equivalent to negative one third x squared plus two equals zero. And so we get two possible solutions here. We get x equals negative root six, or x equals positive root six. And the negative root six solution is not in the interval, so we cross that out. Okay, so our function has only one critical number. So we have learned, we've done these problems a lot. We've learned that, well, if I only have one critical number, that means if it's a local min, it has to be the absolute min. If it's a local max, it has to be the absolute max, right? Because if you only found one critical number, there can't be a min or max anywhere else. So how are we going to justify whether this is a min or a max? What method would you like to use? I'm going to use the second derivative. So if you use the second derivative test, that means you now have to find the second derivative, in other words, the derivative of this thing. Um, I'm just going to use the first derivative test. Yeah, I don't feel like doing product rule all over again. This is what I mean by, you know, which test should you use? Well, if the second derivative is kind of annoying to compute, just forget about it. So our endpoint is at zero. Our critical number is root six. Sine of f prime. What does that mean about the original function? And let's also write down what is our test point. So I can choose one as our test point for the interval zero to root six. And now I need a number that's bigger than root six. So root nine is bigger than root six. And root nine is the same thing as three. I definitely don't use don't use two because two is actually in the other interval. Two is less than root six. All right, and then let's rewrite what our function was. Our derivative was e to the negative x squared over twelve times negative one third x squared plus two. That was our derivative. And now let's substitute our points: f prime of one, f prime of three. Again, the nice thing about the E is that no matter what you plug into E to something, it's always going to be positive. So you only have to look here. Let's see, the one gives me what? Negative one third plus two. So that's a positive number. The three gives me nine over three, negative one, negative three, rather. That's a negative number. We get positive, negative, and lo and behold, we actually did get our maximum as we expected. Okay, good. The question actually did ask for the maximum area, so we just need to substitute that back in. So our maximum area is f of root 6, and the original function was 2x e to the negative x squared over 12. I'm substituting in x equals root 6. So we substitute that in, and we end up with 2 times square root 6 over e. We get the square root of e, because notice if you put in uh, square root 6 here, you get e to the negative 6 over 12 which is e to the negative 1 half, and that's 1 over square root e. So that's why you get kind of a double square root. Okay, so let's see, any questions? So Matan asks, most cases with the critical point prove that it's the max or min we're looking for. Will we ever have a case where a single critical number might be a min when we are looking for a max or vice versa? Um, I think this question was asked a long time ago, and the answer is, yeah. So, I mean, what if, what if this problem actually said, find the minimum possible area? What would have been the answer? Or actually, let's answer the easier question. Let's say the problem was asking for the minimum possible area. Um, how would the work for this problem have changed? Well, none of the work would have changed until you get down to the very last part. 
and you realize, oh shoot, I found a maximum instead. So that means the minimum must be a quote, one of the two endpoints. So it's either at X equals zero or it's off to X going to infinity. And we can actually see from this original function, the original function, if X equals zero, we actually just get an area of zero. And if X goes to infinity, we also get an area of zero. So the minimum area in this case would just be zero. That's probably very obvious just from for, you know principles right you can just take it's very obvious from the very start of the problem just take x equals zero but it's not always obvious what's actually happening for instance i know um there was once a problem on one of the exams about trying to get from one place to another there was like a circular lake and you can you want to get from point a to point b this is actually a very typical optimization problem i believe one is assigned in the official problems um, and you can get from A to B, you can either run around um, the edge of the lake or you can kind of just swim across the lake or some combination. You can like swim across and then run the rest. And you want to find the minimum time it took to get from point A to point B. And these problems are usually designed so that um, actually you find that there is one critical number, but it actually turns out to be a maximum. And the minimum actually was at one of the two endpoints. The, the minimum actually was, it was best just to swim directly across or something like that. So it is very important you always do that last step. Sometimes the problem, it's not quite obvious what the minimum actually is or whether you found a minimum or a maximum.